Hey, how's it going, guys? It's Nate here. And Skyrim is a, I don't think I've used this adjective yet, monumental game. With more than a metric ton of places to visit, characters to see, and quests to fulfill. With such a vast world at our disposal, it's easy to get lost in The Elder Scrolls V. So much so that despite releasing in 2011, there's still a wealth of secrets, easter eggs, and hidden references buried within the game that remain unknown to much of the community. So today we'll be taking a look at yet another 10 tiny details you may still have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Part 35. Starting off, during the quest, Promises to Keep, a shady Breton by the name of Louis Latroche requests that you help him steal Frost, an extremely valuable horse currently owned by Riften's most powerful family, the Blackbriars. The mount can be found in the stables just outside of the Blackbriar Lodge. However, before you can take it and ride off into the sunset, the player will first have to break inside of the building and steal Frost's ownership deed. Once the appropriate document is in your possession, you'll be free to hop on the horse and bring it back to Louis to complete the quest. After which, should you play your cards right, you can even keep them out. Though, that's another story. But, if you take a look at Frost's ownership deed, you'll notice it contains a bit of information regarding his lineage, citing his father and grandfather. Well, Frost's grandfather, or grandsire in horse lingo, was listed with the name Sleipnir. This is a clever easter egg referencing Old Norse mythology, wherein Sleipnir is the name of Odin's legendary eight-legged horse. The beast is said to have been the best horse in history, and what with Odin being so picky, I don't doubt it. But in the world of Skyrim, evidently Sleipnir got a little bit frisky, and had some kids who had some kids of their own. Let's just be thankful the whole eight-legged gene didn't get passed down. Next on our list, armor's an important part in the life of a dragonborn. When you're constantly jockeying with powerful mages, angry gods, and, well, dragons, it's always wise to have some apparel made for the job. However, did you know that if you simply don't feel like wearing any clothes at all, and have no apparel articles equipped, nearby NPCs will have a small chance to call you out for such behavior. Bethesda actually recorded quite a bit of dialogue in relation to characters criticizing the Dovahkin for not wearing any clothes. Take a listen to some of my favorites. You ought to cover your, uh, unmentionables. Please, remove your naked obscenity from the company of civilized folk. It takes a lot of confidence to walk around naked. Trust me on that. Well now, that's a shamefully absurd way to go around in public. Coming in at number three, while we're still talking about AI dialogue and world interactions, if you decide to cast some non-damage inducing spells on NPCs you encounter in cities and settlements, they may in fact respond with some unique dialogue. That was pathetic. It didn't even do anything. Was that some sort of... Healing spell? Now I should point out, when I first learned of this, I was blown away. I thought it was insanely cool. That said, in fairness, I've only really committed to a full-on mages build for like half a playthrough. So I don't have a lot of time playing with magic in cities and whatnot. Therefore, for some of you that have, this may not be news for you. But to me, it was mind-boggling. For fourth spot, should the player ever find him or herself in the middle of a brawl with another character, there's a chance a bystander watching may say the following phrase. Remember, hit the one in the middle. This is a reference to the 1985 film Rocky IV, where the protagonist, a boxer named Rocky Balboa, tells his corner staff in the middle of a boxing match that his vision has become blurry, and he now sees three opponents rather than just one. To which one of his trainers humorously responds, just hit the one in the middle. I'd play the clip, but getting sued by MGM for copyright infringement is not how I'd like to spend the remainder of my 2018. Halfway through at number 5, one contract the Dragonborn will receive during the Dark Brotherhood questline will be given you by a woman named Moiri in Markarth who requests you kill a Breton bandit going by the name Elaine Dufont. We've touched base on this quest in a previous video. Allegedly, Moiri once lived in Windhelm, where she had strong ties to a powerful local family, the Shattershield clan. It was there where she first met Elaine, and the two began a romantic relationship. However, unfortunately, Elaine wasn't a very honest man. He secretly led an entire gang of bandits, and was simply just using Moiri's close connection to the Shatter Shields as a way to scope them out for a planned robbery. As you might expect, one night Elaine and his small entourage of fellow delinquents broke into the Shatter Shield clan home and stole thousands of Septim's worth of items, before leaving Windhelm forever. 
This clearly upset Moiri, who unfortunately was blamed by the Shatter Shields for the whole affair and forced to flee the city. Now she's contacted the Brotherhood and is ready to ensure Elaine Defont sees justice. Well, one of the items stolen by Elaine and his men from the Shatter Shields is an ancient family iron warhammer called Aegis Bane. When you confront Elaine, he'll actually have the item equipped and use it in your ensuing battle. Once Elaine is dead, you can loot the hammer and keep it for yourself. Even after reporting back to Moiri, it's still yours to keep. Now, to be honest, it isn't really all that great, and there's not much of a reason to use it over any other Warhammer in the game. But if you've decided to head back to Windhelm and walk around with Aegis Bane equipped, you'll actually get to hear citizens say some unique dialogue, commenting on the Warhammer. That Hammer. Why, that's Aegis Bane, heirloom of Clan Shatter Shield. Last I heard, it was stolen by a couple of swindlers. Elaine and... Moiri. Yeah. Ah, Aegis Bane. Sigil of Clan Shatter Shield. But didn't that get stolen a while back? Hmm. Must be remembering wrong. Sixth. Athos is a Dunmer warrior for the Companions. He stands out as being the only member of the faction of Elven origin. When you enter Yovaskar for the first time, he and Najada, another companion, can be seen brawling in the Mead Hall. Though, other than that initial incident, Athos isn't a particularly significant character. He plays little to no role throughout the Companion's questline, and really just seems to be there to take up space. However, if you speak to him and ask the Dunmer what made him enlist in the guild, he'll say the following. Fortune and glory, friend. Fortune and glory. Of course, this quote is a reference to the 1984 film, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, where Indy utters that famous line when asked why he's pursuing the Sankara Stones. Again, I'd play the clip, but something tells me that Steven Spielberg is not someone I want to risk getting sued by. Next, did you know that Skyrim's arrows actually have a pretty surprising respect for physics when it comes to the objects they enter contact with? You see, when you fire an arrow at a metallic or otherwise inherently hard object such as a metal cup or a glass, the item itself will deflect the arrow and cause it to ricochet off. But when arrows are fired into softer items like bread, cheese, or even wood, the arrows will instead stick inside that item, rather than just bounce off. I found this to be pretty cool, as I learned it while playing an archer build. I was already pretty aware that arrows could bounce off of some objects and stick inside of others, but I didn't know there was this level of consistency behind the process. So, thanks Todd. Coming in at number 8, Swindler's Den is a small bandit cave in the White Run Hold, just a short ways east from Rorikstead. In the large section in which you first enter from, you'll find a practice training dummy perched up next to a wall with an apple on top of its head. This is an allusion to the popular folktale of William Tell, a legendary Swiss expert marksman whom at one point in his life, as the story goes, indeed shot an apple off of his son's head. While maybe not the best model for responsible parenting, Tell of course, as you can imagine, did succeed in shooting the apple. But looking at where the arrows landed on this practice dummy in Skyrim reveals the bandits did not. Perhaps you can finish what they started. Getting close to the end here at number 9, during the events of the Dragonborn DLC, the player gets an opportunity to visit Apocrypha, the plane of oblivion ruled by Hermias Mora, Daedric Prince of Knowledge and Memory. Apocrypha is an especially creepy environment. It holds this strange dark appearance and aura, and is surrounded by a black sea with weird tentacles emerging from it. This is a world where nightmares are made. Well, as some commenters have pointed out, it seems as though the strange black seas of this realm may in fact be ink, as in the stuff we write with. You see, Apocrypha's structures are almost entirely composed of books and literary works. Likewise, all throughout the region you'll encounter a hostile Daedra known as Seekers, but when idling, those Seekers can be found reading. Clearly books and whatnot are a big part of Hermias Mora's universe. And what with oceans being composed of liquid, it seems to make sense that if not water, ink would be next on Hermias Mora's list. Now, in fairness, this is more of a theory than confirmed fact. For all we know, Bethesda's official canonized version of what composes the Seas of Apocrypha could just be weird black stuff. 
But I mean, hey, we're on part 35. Give me some leeway. <laughs> anyway, for our final spot, the Daedric Quest, the Black Star, sends the player to recover an ancient artifact known as Azora's Star, which is said to effectively be an unbreaking soul gem. And it's your responsibility to return it back to its rightful owner, the Daedric Prince of Dusk and Dawn. The star has fallen into the possession of a former College of Winterhold professor and once well-respected Dunmer mage, Malin Varen, who allegedly first acquired the object years ago while still teaching at the college and believed he could use the star to make himself immortal. Alas, as he experimented and researched, the artifact slowly began to drive him insane cultivating in Malin ultimately murdering a student and subsequently being kicked out of Winterhold. He and a small band of loyal students have since fled to Illinolta's Deep, a small sunken fortress where they're said to be continuing their experiments. Long story short, you head out to the dungeon, clear it of a bunch of necromancers, and find the star. Though strangely, Varen won't be there. After taking the item back to Azora, she'll reveal that Varen's soul is actually inside of the star itself. And before completing the quest, you'll have to go inside of the star too and defeat Maitland in battle in order to complete the quest. Now, Black Star is surprisingly long, but those are the spark notes. But even after you've completed the quest, it seems the story still goes on, as you'll unlock a new potential random encounter in which two necromancers may suddenly pop out of nowhere and attack the Dragonborn. Once defeated, because let's face it, it's never a good idea to attack the protagonist of a video game, you can have a look at their inventories. And one of them will carry a scrolled note, which reads the following, quote, Malin Varen's death will not go unpunished. Find the holder of Azura's star and enact revenge, or it will be your souls I rend for my enchantments, end quote. Even with Malin long dead, it's spooky to imagine that his cult still continues. But on that spooky note, we are going to wrap up. Yet another 10 tiny details you may still have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Part 35. Thanks for stopping by everyone. This series has now been ongoing for well over a year, which is incredible to me. And here's to another one. So what tiny details and Skyrim secrets do you know of that I haven't broken down yet? leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everybody.